As I said, we're going to continue our series on what we've been calling the family portrait. And this is lesson six, and uh, this will be the last lesson in the series, as this is our last normal evening service. You know, next Sunday is my, next, my last Sunday, and we have the special program in the Sunday evening. And so actually what I'm going to try and do is I'm going to try and cram two lessons into one. All right? So listen fast. Okay? Uh, we got two lessons in one. We're talking about roles in marriage when it comes to the family portrait. And obviously, it's kind of two roles. Normally, I would have had this split up in one lesson in regards to the role of the husband, one lesson in regards to the role of the wife. But uh, for this week, I'm just going to combine both, and we'll see what we can do to get through this. Now, as we start this off, I want to see if you can tell me, what do these games have in common? Okay, three games. What do these games have in common? Mother, may I... Red light, green light. You all remember these, right? All the kids are like, of course. Yeah, you guys remember these. Mother May I, red light, green light, and Simon Says. What do these games all have in common? Yeah. Way in the back. Yeah, you've got to do what someone else says. That's exactly right. There's a leader... And they're in charge, they're giving out instructions, and you have to follow these person, this person's instructions. Now, I love uh, you know, playing games with kids, and especially when, there's, when you have to choose a leader. That's always kind of a fun task, trying to choose a leader, because you know that one person's excited and everybody else is disappointed, right? Uh, that's how it goes. I remember, so this actually happened a few weeks ago. My boys had a couple of their friends over to play on a Sunday afternoon, and uh, they were all kind of goofing off in the living room. We'd just gotten home from church on Sunday morning. They were goofing off in the living room, and uh, I had to go, and I was going to change into, uh, you know, out of my suit and all that. And so I said, okay, who's in charge? You know? And uh, I looked at the youngest of all four of them, and I said, okay, this one. And I said his name. He's in charge. And everyone's like, what? Huh? Except for him, and he kind of goes like this. Yeah. He even rubbed his hands like that, and I thought, oh, my, what did I just do, right? (laughs) What did I just do? You know, the idea of being in charge, being the leader, is sometimes very, very misunderstood. And as we're talking about roles in marriage and roles of things like the Bible talks about, about headship, submission, and different relationship between husbands and wives, that's why it's so, so important that we understand what the Bible has to say about these roles for our marriage. And so... We're going to start off just with a quick review. We kind of dove into this a little bit uh, last week as, uh, you know, and this, you don't have blanks for these. This is just a reminder of where we've, where we've been. We talked about, first of all, how God created humans for a specific purpose that he gave us in that purpose, a role that is to be rulers over the earth, a realm, and that is the realm is the earth, that we're to rule the earth as his image bearers. Also, he gave us a responsibility that is to rule the earth by working and keeping it, that we're to cu- cultivate the resources that God has put in the earth for human flourishing and for human society. That's the responsibility that God has given us as image bearers of God. Now, to accomplish that effectively, he gave us a special relationship, and that is the relationship of marriage. And that, of course, is what we've moved into to be talking about for the last several weeks. We looked at how in Genesis chapter 2, verse 18, after God created Adam, he said, It's not good that the man should be alone. I will make a helper fit for him. And, of course, he made Eve And they were united together in that first marriage. And God's purpose for them was to fulfill his purpose that he had for mankind, that they were to work together in that regard. And so God honors marriage. This is something, this is his idea. uh, And he honors it and he views it in high regard. We've looked at these passages before, Proverbs 18, 22. He who finds uh, finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. And then, of course, Hebrews 13, 4, let marriage be held in honor among all and let the marriage bed be undefiled for God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterers. See, God views and honors marriage positively. He, it's a blessing. And he also honors it in a negative sense of that if those who violate uh, marriage, whether that be through sexual promiscuity or through adultery, he is going to judge because this is such a serious thing to God. And then we started talking about 
God's purpose for marriage. What are the purpose for marriage? And you've got three blanks at the top of your sheet uh, that you can see here as far as the purpose for marriage. And we've covered these, so we're not going to go real in depth. But the first one, of course, is partnership. His partnership. That husbands and wives are to be partners working to accomplish God's will together. He gave us a task. He says, look, it's not good for the man to be alone in this task, so I'm going to give him a helper, a partner, who is fit for him. And so husbands and wives are to be partners working together to accomplish God's will together. Number two is parenting. The second purpose for marriage is parenting. You know, it takes a husband, uh, it takes a man and a woman to have a child, and it's God's ideal that a husband and a wife, a mother and a father, would raise the child. And so we put it this way, is the main idea from that lesson was that dads and moms are to partner together in raising children. That's God's ideal. We recognize that that isn't always the case, sometimes because of no fault of our own, but this is God's ideal and his original design and purpose for marriage. And third, and this is what we looked at last week, is that God's purpose for marriage is pleasure that he intended this to be a pleasurable relationship, a relationship of love, a relationship of friendship, a relationship of cooperation. And so the main idea we emphasized in that was that husbands and wives are to be companions who share joy and satisfaction with one another. It's to be a mutual relationship, not 50-50, as some would say, but 100-100 where I'm giving all that I have for my wife and she is giving all that she has for me in this mutually joyful and satisfactory relationship. So those are the purposes that God has given in regards to marriage, uh, partnership, parenting, and pleasure. Then we rolled into, uh, oh, I talked about what God designed marriage to be in regards to a loving relationship. Sorry, I'm going to click through this. We just kind of talked about this real briefly here. We, talk, we began talking last week about the roles in marriage and just kind of a general overview of the concept of roles in marriage is that husbands and wives have different roles. And of course, this is pretty abundantly obvious to those that read the Bible and those that have common sense in regards to uh, human society. Uh, of course, our, our society is kind of going off the rails and does not have much common sense. And so often men and women are try you know, people try to conflate the two or say there's really no difference between them. But we recognize from the scriptures that husbands and wives have different roles. And though they have different roles, their roles are to be complementary. Husbands and wives have complementary roles. And complementary there with an E, not with an I, complimentary, not complimentary. Complimentary with an I is, you know, saying a compliment, something nice. Oh, you look nice today, or that was a wonderful dinner, or uh, you're a hard worker, or some sort of compliment like that. That's not what we're talking about, although husbands and wives should be complimentary with an I towards one another. They should do that as well, but certainly also your roles are to complement one another. That is complete or make perfect. Either two parts or things needed to complete the whole, they're to be counterparts that work together. And of course, that goes right along with the purpose of marriage being partnership. And so husbands and wives have different roles. They have complementary roles. And finally, they have equal roles. Both husbands and wives are made in God's image. Neither the husband nor the wife are superior or inferior to one another. Neither is more important than one another. They have different roles, but those roles are meant to complement one another and they're equal roles. And a great example of this that we looked looked at is the Trinity, that God exists as three distinct persons, that each person is equally God, and there is one God, and these persons relate to one another within different roles, much like a husband and wife do within marriage. So, for example, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3, the Apostle Paul says, I want you to understand that the head of every man is Christ, the head of a wife is her husband, and the head of Christ is God. And so there's an order of authority within marriage, just like there's an order of authority even within the Trinity, that Jesus, as the Son, submits himself to the Father. And we're going to see more of that later on as we talk about these things. We can look at some scriptures where Jesus says in John 4, 34, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. He's submitting himself to the Father's will. In John chapter 5, verse 30, he says, I can do nothing on my own. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just because I seek not my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And so 
this is obviously recognizing that Jesus is not less important. The Son is not less important or less divine than the Father in any sort of way, but they have different roles. And that can be a good example to help us see how husbands and wives have different complementary and equal roles. So tonight, what I want to do is dive into each one of these roles and kind of summarize them. And this is just going to be an overview. This is just going to be a summary. This isn't going to be in-depth of what you could talk about in regards to all of these things. But I hope it will be helpful to give a perspective of what a husband's role within a marriage should be and a wife's role within a marriage should be. And so we're going to start off with the husband's role. And that is a husband's role is leadership. Leadership. Not like uh, maybe a power-hungry child playing Simon Says (laughs) that says, ooh, you have to do what I say kind of leadership, but true, godly, biblical leadership as we're going to see from the scriptures. So first of all, we can take uh, an important note, and you have this in the middle of your sheet, is we need to never use the world's definitions to define the Bible's terms. That's an important thing for us to recognize because when you hear the word leader, people might have all kinds of manner of understanding of what it means to be the leader. Maybe you might think leader and boss are synonymous. They're not necessarily synonymous. Uh, And so we need to have a right perspective. And so we need to make sure not to use the world's definitions to, to define the Bible's terms. So let's look at a couple scriptures to help us understand the the husband's role of leadership and what is the way that a husband should lead. Well, first of all, number one, husbands should lead through love. Before we actually turn to Ephesians chapter 5, I want you to take your Bibles and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. I know we just looked at it together, but let's let's read this passage again to, to see this idea of leadership where it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3, But I want you to understand that the head of every man is Christ, the head of a wife is her husband, and the head of Christ is God. And here Paul uses this terminology of head or headship, as sometimes you'll hear it referred to. And that's the idea of being a leader. Um, and this is how the scriptures uniformly uses this phrase, is that the husband is to be the leader, the head of the home. That's where we get that terminology from in the scriptures. And then I want you to take your Bibles and turn with me to Ephesians chapter 5 to see how he is to lead. And as I noted earlier, the first point that we recognize in understanding how a husband is to lead is a husband should lead through love. Going back to what I said about not using the world's definitions to define the Bible's terms, it's so important for us to understand because we need to use what's called, what we might call biblical leadership. See, there's so much abuse in homes that comes from men who want to be the boss, who want to have their own way, and are going to force their wives or their, ki- their wife or their kids to give them what they want or else. And this is a horrible problem in our society today. And this is not God's intended role for a husband. God's intended role for a husband is to provide godly leadership in the family. Paul says in Ephesians chapter 5 how a husband is to lead his wife. Look in Ephesians chapter 5 and look with me beginning in verse 25 where it says, Wives, submit to your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects 
her husband. Here at the beginning of this passage there in verse 25, he says that husbands are to love as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. This is self-sacrificial love. This is a love that has no regard for yourself, but always puts the needs of others ahead of his own. And this is the foundation for how husbands are supposed to lead. And I want you to see how Paul kind of brings out in this passage how leadership through love works. We're going to look at, first of all, that it's loving by sacrificing himself for her. He's to love his wife by sacrificing himself for her. That's exactly what he says in verse 25, that husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. How did Christ love the church? Well, Jesus told his disciples, he says, greater love has no man than this than that he should lay down his life for his friends. And that's exactly what Jesus did. Jesus says in John chapter 10, I lay down my life freely. No one takes my life from me. I offer it freely. And who did he offer it for? He offered it for you and for me and really truly for the entire world. He died on the cross to take the punishment for our sins. He sacrificed himself and his life for the good of us. And that's exactly how a husband should lead and love his wife, is sacrificing himself for her. Everything that he does should be directed towards her good, not his own good, his own desires. He shouldn't be concerned about what I want or how I feel about this, but he should be concerned about his wife and her needs and, of course, the family as well. And so he's to love by sacrificing himself for her. Also, he's to love by seeking her good, by seeking her good. He says that he might sanctify her. This is where Jesus gave himself up for the church. Why? That he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. Think about how we were before Jesus died for us. Think about the condition that we were in apart from Christ. And of course, that condition is hopeless. That condition is lost. That condition, the Bible says, is completely sick because of sin and dead in our trespasses and sins. And Jesus sacrificed himself for us, and he did it for our good. He did it, as he says here, that he might sanctify us, cleansing us. When it says sanctify her, he's talking about the church. That means he's talking about you. I know, guys, it's kind of weird referring to yourself with female pronouns, and we're not getting into any of the weird stuff, but we're just, you know, using the Bible's language here. He's talking about the church. He's talking about you, that he might sanctify you, that he might cleanse you by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present you, the church, to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. This is all for the good of others. It's all for the good of the church. It's all for the good of us is what Jesus did. And that should be how husbands should love their wives as well, is looking out for her good and what she would need. That leads us to letter C, is loving by providing nurture and care. Provide, by providing nurture and care. And you can see this is in verses 28 and 29 or excuse me, 28 through 30, where he says, In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves his own self. So he's saying, just like Jesus loved the church, husbands, that's how you should love your wives. He goes on in verse 29, he says, For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. And so these verses describe how he provides that loving care and how a husband should provide that loving care. And there's two key words here there in verse 29. He says, but nourishes and cherishes it. And this is really, really important for us to understand both of these concepts here. The idea of nourishing or nurturing is the idea of caring for one's needs. Okay, it's, it's providing for your needs. You have a need, maybe it's food, maybe it's clothing, whatever that may be, I'm going to meet your need. And, you know, a lot of men do a great job at this, you know, and, and men often might tout that, oh, I'm the breadwinner, I go out, I, I earn the money to provide for my family. And of course we should do that. Paul says if you don't do that, you're worse than an infidel. So we shouldn't really be patting ourselves on the back too hard for just doing that. <laughs> and Paul says it's not just doing that. The idea of nour nourishing is, like I said, it's providing for your needs. So let me give you an example. Like, like I just mentioned one need you might have is food. Of course, we all have that, have that need. Our families have that need. And, uh, you know, you as a husband should provide food for your wife. 
But there's all kinds of manner of food that you could provide, right? One, one manner of food that's very, very healthy is oatmeal, okay? Anybody in here like oatmeal? A few people like oatmeal, oh, very good. Any of you like oatmeal exactly how it's told to be prepared on the package, or do you doctor it up with all the sugar and honey and fruit and nuts, right? Yeah, of course, that's what we do. So this was several years ago, and uh, for whatever reason, I kind of got on this kick. I'm like, I'm going to eat oatmeal. It's really healthy. It's really cheap. And I noticed um, how dirt cheap oatmeal is, right? I'm like, man, this is insanely cheap. And so I thought, I wonder, if I ate, if I... S- if I fixed oatmeal for breakfast exactly according to the package, not loading it up with all the brown sugar and honey and fruit like I normally do, but just like how it's provided on the package, and I had oatmeal every day for a year, how much would that cost? This was probably about six years ago. Anyone want to take a stab? You know, I've told you this, not you. I don't know. Yeah. How, what do you think, Doug? About 25 bucks is exactly right. I had breakfast with a friend at Riverside Cafe this last week, and I, and I said, hey, man, I'll pay, because I had one of these like free meal coupon codes, <laughs> one of these coupons. So I, one, of my meal, one of the meals was paid for, and I still didn't get out of there for less than 25 bucks for one meal. And this w- so that would be wonderfully nutritious, wonderfully frugal, and horribly boring, right? (laughs) I mean, who wants to eat just plain oatmeal all year? But you're nourishing. But that's where Paul moves from nourishes and cherishes it because the idea of nourishment is, hey, I'm providing for your needs. Here's some oatmeal. That provides for your needs. But the idea of nourishing and cherishing is you go beyond just providing for their needs, but also providing them what would make them comfortable. That's the idea of cherishing. It's to warm someone. It's to care for someone beyond just their bare necessities, but also what would they enjoy, what they would be comfortable. And Paul is talking about ourselves. He says in verse 29, no one ever hated his own flesh. And he's talking about you. Because like I did this experiment and I'm thinking to myself, how much would this cost? Oh yeah, about 25 bucks. Yeah, right. There's no way I would ever do that because... I want to I enjoy the food that I eat. And so he's saying, look, you nourish and you cherish yourself, and that's how you should think towards your wife as well. So you think about it. You need clothes. You don't just put on anything that covers your body. You put on comfortable clothes. You put on clothes that you like. You don't just pick whatever food happens to be the cheapest and would nourish you the most. You pick food that you enjoy. And that's the idea of how a husband should love his wife is he provides for her needs. Yes, that's, that's what we should do. But he goes above and beyond and says, honey, what do you love? What do you enjoy? That's what I want to provide. Because I don't want you just to to have your needs met. I want you to be happy. I want you to enjoy life with me as your partner. And so loving by providing nurture and care in this relationship. And then finally, letter D is loving by remaining exclusively devoted to her. By remaining exclusively devoted to her. And Paul emphasizes this in verse 31, where he says, Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Men, are you exclusively devoted to your wife in every way? In your affection? In your attention? In what you look at? In your relationships? This is a way that husbands are to love their wives by being exclusively devoted to her. So much so, and we're not even just talking about romantic relationships where we're not going into affairs or pornography or anything like that. But he says, a man shall leave his father and mother. That is that, yes, that was your old family, and that's not excluding them. It's not like you cut ties with your family or anything like that. But the whole idea is that now the the relationship with them is not the binding relationship in your life anymore. The relationship now with your wife is the main focus of your life because you are exclusively devoted to her. And so Paul says in verse 33, let each one of you love his wife as himself. And so husbands should lead through love. Also, another way that husbands should lead, number two is this, husbands 
should lead in understanding. Husbands should lead in love, and husbands should lead in understanding. And a key verse for us to understand this point is 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7, where the Apostle Peter says, Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as a weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. And I think it's interesting that when Paul is talking about living with your wife in an understanding way, he highlights some things that are natural differences between husbands and wives, between men and women, as he says, showing honor to her as the weaker vessel. And of course, we recognize that men and women are different. And one way, of course, is physically. Men are generally bigger, stronger. Uh, and, and so in, when he's talking about weaker vessel, he's not talking about worth. He's not talking about intellect. He's not talking about moral aptitude or anything like that. He's talking about the physical makeup. And husbands need to recognize that and be considerate of these things and live in an understanding way towards his wife. Well, what does that mean? Well, first of all, letter A, it means that you're considerate of the ways that she is different. That you're considerate of the ways that you, she is different. As he says there in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7, he says... Uh, giving honor to the wife as unto the weaker vessel. You're taking that into consideration and you're recognizing that that's a significant and important difference. And you take that into consideration as you lead. Not only just being considerate of the ways that she is different, but you're thankful and celebrate the ways that she is different. And we should look at our wives and recognize the ways that they are different than us and praise God for that. I understand that differences between husbands and wives often cause conflict in a marriage. And that's, of course, natural, as you have two different people who are trying to unite together as one. But this is something that we need to remember to be thankful for and to celebrate. Remember, it's not good that the man should be alone. It's not good that the man should be alone. When God looked at Adam by himself, he said, something's missing. This is, uh, this is not a complete picture. This is not sufficient to fulfill my purposes. He needs something else. There's something missing. And what he gave wasn't, another, wasn't a thing, but it was another person who was different than him. And this is something that Adam, in Genesis chapter 2, celebrated, and we as men should be thankful for and celebrate. Just a couple quotes to help us recognize this idea here. General George S. Patton put it this way. He said, if everyone is thinking alike, then somebody isn't thinking. And, you know, we've all had those times in our marriage where we're butting heads and we're just not thinking alike. And you think, man, if you just, if you just get on board with what I have to say, well, you know, if everyone's thinking alike, then somebody isn't thinking. Dr. Ben Carson put it this way. If two people think the same thing about everything, one of them isn't necessary. He goes on and puts it this way. We need to be able to understand that if we're going to make real progress. And men, we need to understand that our wives are different from us for a reason. And we need to be understanding of those differences and take those things into consideration in regards to how we lead. And so letter C, you could put it this way, is leading and understanding means you work together as a team. I don't have this on your sheet, but you might put it in parentheses, not separately like a boss. I think a great example is like, for example, on a football team. You know, you've got a quarterback, he's the leader, but uh, any good quarterback knows they can't do it by themselves. They need their team and they work together as a team. Yes, he's the leader, he may call the plays, but they all work together to accomplish the same goal. So some keys to understand. You don't have blanks for this, and there's not on the PowerPoint, but I just wanted to give you just a few rapid points of keys to understanding. Is One is getting to know her taking time to talk to your wife and get to know her and who she is and what she is like and, and uh, why she thinks the way that she does so that you can understand her and live with her in understanding. That involves, of course, number two, listening to her, taking time to talk. Letter number three would be asking questions and understanding her perspective. And then lastly, making decisions together. Not that, hey, I'm the man, and so I make all the decisions, but no, we're a team. We make these decisions together because as... You know, Ben Carson puts out, you know, if everyone's thinking the same thing, one isn't necessary. But God makes it very, very clear that both husband and wives are necessary to work together as a team to accomplish his purpose. Finally, number three in regards to a, ways that a husband should lead is that a husband should lead through service. A husband should lead through service. And I want you to take your Bibles and turn to Matthew chapter 20. 
This is really key when we understand, back on that phrase that I used earlier, of not using the world's definitions to define the Bible's terms. When Paul talks about the husband being the head of the wife or being the leader, we should immediately think, how does the Bible define leadership? And Jesus does it very, very clearly for us. Back in Matthew chapter 20, you look at verse 20. It says, Then the mother of the sons of Zebedee came up to him with her sons, and kneeling before him, she asked him for something. And he said to her, What do you want? She said to him, Say that these two sons of mine are to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your kingdom. James and John are the sons of Zebedee, and they get their mom to go and ask for them. And what are they asking for? They're, they're asking for authority. They want leadership positions. They want positions of power and influence within Christ's kingdom. Notice what Jesus says in verse 22. You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I am to drink? They said, we are able. That's a pretty bold statement. Verse 23, he goes on and said, and Jesus said to them, you will drink my cup, but to sit at my right hand and at my left hand is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared by my father. And when the 10 heard it, they were indignant at the two brothers. I've often, why were they so indignant? Was it because, you know, man, they got to it first? <laughs> I should have thought of that question. I don't know. But Jesus called them to him and said, and so in verse 25, he's like, okay, these guys don't understand they don't, they, they're not grasping what it really means to have authority in my kingdom. They're not grasping what it really means to be the leader. So he gives them a clear instruction on leadership, and leadership is through service. He says this in verse 25. You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. It shall not be so among you. He says that's how the world views leadership. Let me tell you how my people view leadership. Whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be your slave, even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Remember, G Paul said that husbands are to love their wives as Christ loved the church. What was Christ's purpose? He said, I didn't come to be served. I didn't come to have people do what I wanted or for my good. I came to serve. Serve so much to give my life as a ransom for many. Husbands, that's God's call for you. That's how he calls you to lead your wives is through love, through understanding, and through service. That's a husband's role is leadership. So let's talk now about a wife's role. A wife's role, if a husband's role is leadership, then what would be the wife's role? And the, what we could summarize it this way in one word, how I think would be the best word to summarize it is the word partner. A wife's role is to partner with her husband. And there's a number of passages that we could look at uh, that you have listed on your sheet. If you look at the top of your sheet, there's any number of verses. We've already looked at Genesis 2:18, where she is to be a helper fit for him. Uh, if you take your Bibles and turn to, back to Ephesians chapter 5, this will be a key text that we'll look at and where we'll start in regards to the idea of a wife's role of partnering, where in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22, it says, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his own body, and is himself its Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. This idea of being a team, being a partner with your husband as the leader. And he talks here about submission. And submission is a word that you might hear a lot in regards to this discussion. And it's important for us to understand some words in regards to submission. First of all, we need to point out that wives are to submit to their own husbands. That's exactly what he says in this verse, verse 22. And he even uses the word own. Wives, submit to your own husbands. This is not a general statement about women submitting to all men. Women are equal in every way to men and do not need to submit to men just because they are men. It's because of the unique relationship between a husband and a wife that a woman should submit to that particular man and for that reason only. 
So we recognize that wives are to submit to their own husbands. Also, I want to give you the reminder that we never use the world's definitions to define the Bible's terms. How does the world define submit? Where most often do you hear this term in modern society? Well, I don't know. We probably operate in different circles, but where I often hear this term is in fighting. There's all kinds of different fighting, UFC, MMA, and all kinds of different fighting, and we talk about uh, one fighter causing another fighter to submit. That is, you beat them, you pummel them, you, you grapple them so much so that they're either uh, in pain or whatever to the point that they just completely give up and say, you win. And that's sometimes what the world has in regards to the idea of submission, is this wrong view of submission. And so we need to have a biblical understanding of what is the Bible talk about when it's talking about wives submitting to their husbands. And I think a great example, and we've already talked about this somewhat, is the example of Jesus submitting to the Father. Jesus willingly submitted himself to the Father. We already looked at a number of verses along those lines where he says, I do not seek my own will, but I only seek the will of the Father. We can see a couple other verses. For example, in Matthew chapter 26, verse 39, where he says, going a little further, he fell on his face and he prayed, saying, my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Jesus is submitting himself to the Father doing what he would have him to do. And as he says in John chapter 10, verse 17 and 18, he says, for this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me. He's saying, no one's making me do this. This is my own choice. I'm doing this willingly. He says, I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father, or this authority is what he's referring to. He's received from his Father. And so Jesus' example is one of willing submission to the authority of the Father. The Father didn't force him to do this. He didn't make him to do this. Jesus chose to do this. The word submit a simple definition, you got a place there where you could fill in a simple definition of submit. It's, it's really a military term. It's the idea of to line up under. You see a military in ranks or in lines. That's the idea they're submitting, they're falling in line uh, under the command. And one thing to take note, and I've already kind of emphasized this, but it's super, super important to un- recognize when it comes to submission, is this is always voluntary. This is always voluntary. And I want you to see why I would say something like that, and especially in regards to this discussion, because it says in verse 22, wives submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. He goes on in verse 24, he says, now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. We're the church. Should we obey the Lord? Of course. Do we always obey the Lord? No. Does Jesus ever force you to do anything? No, he doesn't. When you obey Jesus, it's because you've chosen to obey. It's not because you've been compelled or forced to that obedience. We need to recognize forced submission is not submission. Forced submission is manipulation, coercion, or slavery. That has nothing to do with what Paul is talking about here of wives submitting to their husbands. This is important for husbands to recognize. Right there in the middle on the back of your sheet, you got two points there where it says this is important for husbands because it greatly affects how you lead. When you recognize this understanding of submission, it will greatly affect husbands how you lead. And I know I'm going backward in the lesson, but it's important for us to recognize these points. And that is husbands must never lead by power, force, or manipulation. Husband, you are called to lead, but you need to lead in a godly way. You need to lead in a biblical way, and that is never by power, force, or manipulation. That is not how Jesus led his disciples, that's not how he leads the church today. Instead, husbands must always lead by service, example, and instruction. This is exactly how the Apostle Peter says that pastors are to lead the church. He says in 1 Peter chapter 5, 
He says in verse 2, he says, Shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, that is leadership, not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly. Verse 3 is key here. Not domineering over those in your charge, but by being examples to the flock. He's saying, look, you're to lead the church just like the good shepherd leads his church. And husbands, you're to lead your wives the same way that Jesus led leads the church. And so that's important for husbands to understand this correct understanding of submission. It's also important for wives because it helps us to realize these things. And I, I include these because I've heard this so many times in conversations with women, in conversations, whether that be in marriage counseling or just different conversations within church over the years. It's important for wives to have this understanding of um, of submission because you need to recognize what God actually calls you to. You see, many women have obeyed sinful instructions from their husbands, thinking that God said they have to submit no matter what. Well, if he says it, I have to do it. Many women have endured abuse from their husband without ever getting help for themselves or for their kids because they thought, well, God said I have to submit no matter what. And that was their understanding of what it meant to submit. But we need to realize what it actually means to submit. And that will help us to realize one thing is that submission does not mean you always have to do what your husband says. Remember, it says, as unto the Lord. The Lord would never ask you to do something that is wrong, and neither should your husband. If he does, you don't have to do it, and you shouldn't do it. You should obey a higher authority, and that is the Lord, rather than your husband, if he's calling you to do something that is wrong or sinful. Also, this means submission does not mean that you have no voice. You know, a husband's leadership should be with understanding. We've already covered that. Husbands and wives are partners together and should make decisions together as a team. If a husband routinely does not do this, then he is not leading as God intends. And it's wise for a wife to get help for her marriage in that regard and to speak up as God would desire her to. Finally, submission does not mean that you cannot get help. It's true that a wife in submission is under her husband's authority, but remember that your first priority is obedience to God. Also remember that your husband is under God's authority, which includes the church and the government. And so if a husband is, not, is consistently not leading how he should, then a wife has every right and possibly even her responsibility to get help for her, for her husband, for her marriage, and possibly for her children as well. And so having that understanding of submission and recognizing that we're to submit as, uh, as the church submits to Christ, what is, what is a wife's role then as a partner with her husband? Well, I want to give you, wrapping up here with three points of a way that a wife can be a great partner to her husband. First of all, is a wife follows her husband's leadership as a teammate. A wife follows her husband's leadership as a teammate. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22, he says, Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. You can compare this with John 15, where Jesus is talking about his leadership over the disciples. And this will help us give a great picture of what a marriage should be like. In, Matthew, excuse me, in John chapter 15, verses 10 through 17, Jesus puts it this way. He says, If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my father's commandments and abide in his love. These things have I spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Just thing to note here before we continue on there, he's talking about commandments. He's talking in terms of authority. Jesus has authority over his disciples, just like a husband would have authority over his wife. But he goes on and talks about it in this context. He says, verse 13, greater love has no one than this, than that someone would lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends, if you do what I command you, no longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all that I have heard from the Father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide, so that whatever you ask in my Father's name, he may give it to you. These things I command you so that you, so that you will love one another. He, he kind of turns the relationship. He says, you're not my servants. He says, you're my friends. And he talks in terms of partnership here. He says, everything that I've heard from the Father, I've made known to you. We're, we're partners together to accomplish the Father's will. And he says, you didn't choose me, but I chose you and I appointed you that you would go and bear fruit for God's glory. There are to be partners working together as a team. 
And this is how a wife is to follow her husband. And, and man, I love the analogy of a football team. Like I said earlier, a quarterback is the leader, but he works together with the rest of his team to accomplish the goal together. One is not more important than the other. They all work together as teammates. And this is how a wife can be a great partner to her husband. Number two is this. Oh, we already looked at that passage there. Number two is this. A wife commits herself to her husband as his companion. A wife commits herself to her husband as his companion. This is such an important way that a wife can be a great partner to her husband is by committing herself to her husband as his companion. Last time when we talked about, um, uh, the last lesson Sunday, we talked about husbands and wives loving one another. And we looked at this passage in Titus chapter 2. Titus 2, verses 4 and 5, it says, And so train the young women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind, submissive to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be reviled. Yes, of course, it talks about being submissive to their husbands, but what I wanted to key in on is verse 4, where he says that young women are to love their husbands. And we noted last week that this word love is actually a different word than what Paul uses for a husband loving his wife back in Ephesians chapter 5. There it's the the self-sacrificial agape love, that divine love that God has for his people. Here it's the word that we get our word Philadelphia or brotherly love. Phileo is the word. It's, It's a brotherly or a friendship kind of a love. And so that's why I put number two as a wife commits herself to her husband as his companion. Because wives, one way that you can just be an amazing partner to your husband is by just enjoying life with him, being a friend with him, enjoying things together. You know, you see this in dating all the time. This is, I, I've seen this in, uh, in some of my friends' life that uh, they find a girl, they start dating, and they're like, yeah, we're going out on a date. We're going, we're going to a Wichita Thunder game. I'm like, dude, you found a girl that wants to go to hockey with you? That's awesome. You know, or, or we're going to go out skeet shooting together. And you're like, man, that's amazing. Two or three years into the marriage, you're like, when's the last time you went to a hockey game? Ah, she doesn't want to go with me anymore. <laughs> Your friends together, though, that's, that's a great way because, man, a guy that has a, a wife that wants to be a participate with him in the things that he enjoys, man, that is just golden in regards to the relationship. Earlier this summer... My family went on a vacation. Uh, We went to Michigan to visit family for a while. And uh, then while I was there, I got a camper for my brother. And then we went camping on Table Rock Lake. Um, We were there at Table Rock Lake for about a week. And we had all these kind of outdoorsy sorts of things to do. And one of the things that I'd heard about on Table Rock Lake is cliff jumping. And I'm like, whoa, that sounds awesome. Now, I know like legit cliff jumping is like, you know, 30, 25, 30, 40 feet. I got little kids, okay? We're not going extreme cliff jumping or anything like that, but we did want to find some pretty cool uh, places where we could, you know, just jump off some pretty high, high spots. And so we actually found this one place. It was about 9 or 10 feet high off the water, so not like crazy high or anything like that, but a little intimidating if you don't like heights. And uh, so I got out there, and I'm, I enjoy this kind of thing, but I'm a little squeamish when it comes to heights, and, but I've got both my boys and all my girls watching me. So I got to step out to the edge and I'm like, all right, I can't even hesitate. I'm just going for it. So I jump in and kind of test the water and everything. And then my boys right away, they're like, oh, dad, I want to do it. I want to do it. And so they jump in. We're like, yeah, this is awesome. We're having a great time. And um, we kind of spend the day down by the water for a little while. And we're down there. And uh, Maria and my wife are like, huh. (laughs) And I don't remember who said what when. I think you said it to her, right? That I'll do it if you will. Okay? So we get back to where this, like, 10-foot high cliff is, this drop-off is, and uh, Amy gets over to the edge, and uh, she stands there and stood there (laughs) and stood there for quite a while, and just as I was like, "Ah, it's not going to happen, she goes for it. And she gets out of the water, and I'm like, babe, that was the coolest thing ever. <laughs> you are so hot right now, you know what I'm saying? That's, that's what I was thinking. I'm like, that was so awesome. 
that she would just jump in like that with us. And then Maria went in also, and we just had a great time. But it was that companionship. It was that friendship. And it, you, it bonded us together even more. It was so, so cool. And that's a great way that a wife can be a great partner to her husband, is a wife who commits herself to her husband as his companion. Finally, number three, let's wrap it up with this point, and that is a wife is a great companion or a great partner when a wife respects her husband as her leader. And just one passage here there's, there's, um, that you could take note of is First Peter, or excuse me, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 33, where it says, However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Why is that? This is a great way to be a great partner to your husband is by showing him respect, showing him honor, as 1 Peter chapter 3 talks about, as a wife honoring her husband. And husbands and wives, when we see the roles that God has for us, and when we live in harmony with one another, fulfilling those roles, we can experience that complementary relationship that God intends, that it, yes, there's two very different people that truly can be united as one to accomplish God's purpose for his glory together. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for the time you've given to us to look into your word. Thank you so much for the privilege that you've called many of these folks to to live in a, a united relationship with their spouse. And Lord, we recognize that this is a serious matter that this is uh, a way that you have devised to show the love that you have for the church. And I pray that we, as husbands and wives, would understand the role that you've called us to and that we would fulfill those roles for the good of our spouse and for your glory in our lives. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You are dismissed. Mm